to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it. We have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to a well-designed business. It's Power Talk Friday. Today, I'm joined by Casey Gromer of C-Suite Boutique. C-Suite Boutique works as fractional integrators for entrepreneurs. <laughs> like, is that amazing, right? Under their leadership, clients have scaled their businesses while working less and spending more time doing what they love. It sounds amazing, doesn't it? Casey also has a podcast called Female Founders Breaking Boundaries, where she encourages women to ditch traditional male-dominated business advice in favor of a more realistic, more workable way of running your business while still achieving success. Now, you may know what an integrator is. You may have no idea or what they do. Um, but the thing is, there are different roles and different levels from executive assistant to COO, a DOO, and an OBM. What are all of these ABCs? Well, Casey is here to explain them to us, okay? Um, I love this episode because it's important for us to know these roles and it's important for us to kind of visualize how we might put them into our business. As you'll hear in the episode, everyone that I've spoken to that has hired a high-performing team member said it was one of the best decisions they've ever made. I know I've already, I guess a couple of years now it is, that I've hired executive assistants. And my current executive assistant, Mariali, I hired, it's coming on a year now, and I cannot tell you how I love this lady. <laughs> I just cannot tell you enough. I mean, when you have somebody right by your right hand like that, who just kind of thinks it before you say it, that tells it to you before you need it, you won't go back. Okay. It's like when you first hire, you know, I don't know, I'm not even going to go down the road <laughs> before we get to the show. Did you know that registration is open for Luann Live? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Luann Live 2023, health and wealth, a well-designed business within a well-designed life. You do not want to miss this. So far, I have Brad Levitt from AFT Construction coming. We have Cheryl Luckett coming, Eileen Hahn, Amber Dilla Garza, Katie McDonald, Rachel Bozick, Christy Rocha, uh, and Heather Hansen is going to be our MC. This is going to be incredible. And I'm actually still adding rock stars as we speak. Okay. We're going to be in Orlando, November 5th through 8th, 2023. And I'm going to tell you, it's crazy because there are 330 seats available. Two weeks ago, I was like, okay, 330. And you know, and I think I told you in last week's show on day one, we sold 60. So don't hesitate. Okay, don't hesitate. If you know you want to be there, if you were with us the last time and you remember how incredible it was, or everybody you know has told you, oh my goodness, you missed Luann Live 2019, you got to come. Okay, even 2021 virtually, it was amazing. So, this is not your garden variety, you know, regular experience. I promise you, I bring 100, forget 100%, I bring two billion percent <laughs> to this. Okay, it is uh, going to be Sunday to Wednesday. If you do the VIP, it's through Wednesday, general admission is through Tuesday in Orlando, and we are going to have tons of fun and tons of mind blowing ideas so that you can get your personal person, your human being, body, brain, soul, and mind aligned with your business goals. 
okay? Because that's what we want for you. We want for you every day to get up and be super happy and super proud and super confident in who you are, what you're doing, and the talents that you're bringing to the rest of us in the world, okay? So please join us. Go to LuannLive.com and sign up. All righty. I am really excited to introduce you to Casey Grober. Hey, Casey, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast today. Hi, Luann. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's not possible for you to even be one-tenth as excited as I am, Casey. <laughs> I promise you that. <laughs> and that's a lot because I'm a very excitable person. So <laughs> I am too. And I'm just telling you, I have buckets for both of us. All right. Oh, my goodness. No, honest to goodness. Um, you know, this whole conversation, integrator, COO, DOO, OBM, I like this is a topic that has been chasing me in circles for the last six or seven months. And I just love your clarity on this topic. And so we're going to run through this. And I would love for us to start exactly there, Casey. Awesome. Run through for me the differences of this alphabet soup of people that can help us in our businesses. Awesome. I, I'm going to do that. And I'm actually going to throw another one in there. Um, <laughs> this one is not an acronym, so it kind of stands out. But um, there's also executive assistants. And they, oh, okay. So they're all very similar roles. And um, I am talk about this on my podcast, Female Founders Breaking Boundaries, because uh, I get a lot of questions from people uh, when they're, you know, connecting with me to see if I can support them. Like, hey, do you do this? Do you do this? Do you do this? And uh, so I realize there's a lot of confusion around who we need in our business at any given time. And so I'm going to kind of explain some of the differences between these different roles. And um, we're going to start with an executive assistant. And for those of you who are just bogged down in administrative tasks and at any given time are trying to get all of the minutia off of your plate, or if you're someone who feels like I just don't even have capacity to manage myself anymore, I need someone to come and manage me you probably need an executive assistant. This is a role that I actually recommend to anyone, regardless if you have a OBM, C-O-O-D-O-O, -O -O, or an integrator. Um, and the executive assistant, you want to kind of think of as an extension of yourself. So if I could make two of me, uh, my executive assistant would be that the other me. So they're going to basically come in and tell you what to do. And if you're someone who feels like that would be helpful or useful, then um, that's an executive assistant. So I have to tell you, <laughs> I have had a version of an executive assistant for probably three years this summer. And my most recent one has been with me. It will be a year in July. Awesome. And Oh mm -hmm. my goodness, mm -hmm. all the difference in the world. For any one of you listening that you've interacted with Mariali, Mariali is my executive assistant and you're right. It's literally like there are some days I'm like, Mary, just tell me where to go and what time to be there. Like, yeah. and like, I don't want to think, I don't want to get to my, like what every single thing has to be in my calendar. If I need a piece of paper, if I need a information, like every sponsor conversation I have, it's like the email has to be in the calendar appointment. I'm not going to go in and out and find all the things because I literally will slide into the seat at 158 for a two o'clock meeting. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you have Love to know it. why you're there and what you're yes. talking about and who you're talking to. And yes, exactly. It's so funny because so just today, like, I will review my calendar, right? But sometimes we just do it by Voxer where I'm looking at the calendar. I'm Voxering my questions. And just today I was like, okay, this... I see the sponsorship um, appointment and I see the name of the company. I said, but I like, what's NA after it? Like not applicable. Like, what are we doing? And she comes back. She's Lou. That's their North American division. I'm like, ah, okay. That's good. <laughs> Sometimes shorthand only works on yeah. one end of the conversation. <laughs> so, all right. So let's say though, you have your executive assistant, but you need um, most of the clients I work with, um, and I imagine a lot of listeners of your podcast, Luann, are very visionary. Mm -hmm. And 
Visionary to me is someone who is just wild crazy with creativity and ideas and they're going to change the world and they're going to do big things and they're just like vomiting awesomeness of ideas. (laughs) But visionary thinkers and visionary people sometimes are not capable of getting to the execution of that. So they see this big idea and the end result, but they have no idea how to get from where they are now to where they need to be. And so now we're going to talk about the roles. So the executive assistant is an extension of you. And we're going to talk about the roles that are actually going to be the yin to your yang. So someone who's actually going to come in and say, I I know exactly what you're saying. I see your vision. I see your future. We're going to make that happen. And there's lots of different ways that you can get support in that manner. And um, what you're going to find out from our conversation today is there's going to be varying levels of skill and there's going to be varying levels of investment in terms of how much you're going to pay somebody. Okay. So so I just want to interject here. So it sounds like to me that once you get to a moment in (laughs) your business where you start thinking holy cow. Like every day just seems chaotic and, you know, yada, yada. And I keep, you know, maybe I continue to show up at appointments with, I haven't gathered all my things. Like I was just talking, mine are virtual appointments, but designers are going to real appointments, right? Um, All the things like the executive assistant is the first level of defense. And that is almost like a non-negotiable at some point. It's like, you're going to get to that. To me, it reminds me of in my home, I remember when, you first are building your business and you're starting to get busy and your hours are getting smaller and smaller. The first thing that we always say is hire the housekeeper. Like yes. why are we spending five hours a week cleaning our house when we can spend five hours a week building the business? Yes. So the executive assistant is that first level defense. And then that may get you through three months, six months, a year, right? It could get you through three years, right? Yes. It, yes, it could get you through several years, but then you're going to get to the part where Luann is now. Well, you're going to be like, I'm really losing my marbles and we all need more help. (laughs) Exactly. Well, this is probably some of the common things that are kind of going to be running through your head are, um, I have no idea if anything's getting done. I have no idea if what we're doing is working. Um, we're not the The business is just maintaining, right? We're stagnant. We're not going anywhere. It's just all we can do to keep the train on the rails every day. So these are some of the things that you're thinking in your head at this point. Um, You're reading my mind. You know that. (laughs) Awesome. And and my poor team, Ali will vox them. I'm like, you guys probably all did it, but I don't know if you did it. I just need to know you did it. Did you do it? Exactly. Yes. I, this is stuff I actually And they're hear. always like, yes, we did it. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, so you're the OBM, so if we're following our acronyms here, stands for Online Business Manager. Um, for designers, this can also be just a plain business manager. It doesn't have to be online. But business manager is kind of a step above executive assistant. So your executive assistant is going to be skilled and have a little bit of knowledge about your business and how your business runs. And they're going to be really trained to think exactly the way you think. But a business manager is going to kind of be your next level of, okay, I have a bunch of stuff going on. Um, I don't know how to get from A to Z. I can't manage all of my tasks. So a business manager is going to be um, someone who is a little bit more task oriented, but they're going to be able to um, look at goals that you have and break them down into smaller steps and manageable parts. And they're going to be able to actually complete some of that work for you and manage some of that work for you and keep track of all of the steps and the due dates and the deadlines and the budgets. And so um, they're definitely a workhorse. So if you're somebody who has a smaller team or you have, um, you're very good at like, I know what projects I need to complete. I know some of the goals I have for the next year. I know what those things are. Then you could easily get a business manager or an OBM in line to just kind of keep track of, are we making progress on getting some of that done? Okay. So let's, let's break it down a little bit. So I, I, you know, it's funny because it, it strikes me in some of the interior design businesses that I have um, worked with, 
you do get to a point where there's a project manager. So maybe you have two or three senior designers, one, two, or three senior designers working under you, but there's that project manager, yes. which is like a business manager, which is like an office manager is what you're saying, which is literally just not so much the strategy in the big picture, right? So maybe they're meeting with the CEO or the principal designer, um, but it's not like you're relying on that person to say, this is the next goal we should set. It's like yes. you've either said it or you've said it with the team or this was person, but then that person is just the one that you like, did the thing get done? And you ask them instead of asking 16 people yes. around. Yeah. Okay. So you'll, okay. yeah, they're, they're not going to be good at telling you, I think we need to be doing this, but they're going to be very good at, you need to initiate, you need to hand them something and then they're going to make sure it gets done. Okay. So, yeah. That's, that's a, like a, that mid step, right? It's yeah. It's like, yeah, I like it. Very yeah. good. So then we kind of have this next level, which is um, what some people call director of operations. And different industries have different terminologies for this kind of level. But for the sake of this recording, we're going to call them a director of operations. So this is going to be somebody who is a little bit more advanced in skill than your business manager. So they're going to be somebody who you can kind of trust to hand off bigger projects. Um, while your business manager might be good at managing projects, they're probably not going to be super great at managing people. Mm. So a director of operations is going to look across your entire business. So across your, um, um, your finances, your sales and marketing, and your um, operations, which is going to be the de designers and you know people who are out there fulfilling client projects, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they're going to have a more bird's eye view than a an OBM or a business manager. They are still not going to be super strategic. So they're going to still sit in with you and listen to you say, this is what I want to do with the business. Can you help me get it done? So they're going to be better at people managing they're going to have a little bit more business knowledge. Um, they're going to be a little bit more trustworthy and I can hand more stuff off to them and trust that it's going to get done. Okay. So, um, so that's the, the, the biggest difference between business manager and a director of operations is kind of that like, we're, we're not just looking at projects now. We're looking at collaboratively all the moving parts of the, of the the business. Okay. And so where I'm starting to hear some distinctions are a, an executive assistant and an OBM, I'm still their manager. Yes. Right. Yep. That's, that's the clarification I'm hearing. Whereas if I start to get into this next level of DOO, there's a layer of them managing some of the people in addition to the projects and more reporting to me as opposed to me being in every staff meeting or every marketing meeting or every budget meeting or every whatever it is. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. yes. Okay. Okay. So, and it probably happens, you know, it's, it's based on the growth of your business too. Right. Like, are you, do you still have bandwidth to manage people or not? Right. right. Yes. Okay. 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 Good. All right. So now we kind of get into this integrator or COO, and this is where things start to get a little gray instead of black and white. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with what who an integrator is, they're basically the same as a COO. It's kind of a unique term that's been coined by a certain um, framework out there. But integrators um, and COOs are basically uh, going to run your business for you. So this is for someone who is ex super visionary. Maybe you have multiple businesses. Maybe you have multiple passions. Um, maybe you're just like, I've been doing this for 10 years. I am exhausted. I just want to do the parts I love and like trust that somebody else is just going to run the whole show for me. This is getting into your integrator level or your COO level where this person is going to basically be your right-hand person. They're going to run the business. They're going to be good at strategy. So while they don't own the vision that you have, they understand the vision and they are um, completely engulfed by it so that when it comes time for annual planning or if you're looking at, if you do some quarterly planning, if you're looking at growth of the business or next steps for the business, they are going going to be better equipped to come with you with suggestions and recommendations. Like based on what's happening in the market or the industry or with our team, this is what I see as a good next step 
for this business. Okay. Now the gray area here though, is there are, there are, um, levels of integrators. And so on the, on the one end of the spectrum of integrators, you could technically say that might be a director of operations. So those are a little bit interchangeable. And then on the other end of the spectrum of integrator is the, the one that's like, I can show up once a month to my business and I can trust that everything is going to still be functioning well and functioning properly. So that's the gray area where, um, kind of depending on what kind of support, what level of support, how much you want to pay, how much you want to be involved and kind of what skill set you need. Um, that's kind of like that DOO and integrator COO, uh, spectrum. Okay. So question for you. Yeah. Is there, I mean, I can see the progression, right? So I can see the progression file, you know, I'm completely, I can't even handle my own email. True statement. I have an executive assistant. Then it's like, oh, we have an executive assistant. Then we have Diana, who's our marketing coordinator. Then we have our outside marketing team. Then we have our creative director, Nicole Heimer, Glory and Brand. Like this is the, all of the, you know, um, the, the people that make the things happen here. Plus we have our writers and we have our audio and editing team, right? There's a lot of moving parts, right? Yeah. And so the thing is, and it's the same with the designer. They've got junior designers, they've got senior designers, they've got purchasing people, they've got their marketing team, they've right. got um, their vendors that they manage and their outside consultants that all funnel into the coordination of a project, right? Yes. So the thing is, is it always you know, one, two, three, or do you sometimes like once you have an executive assistant and you got that down, maybe you do go right to an integrator or you go, oh, so that it's not like you definitely have to build it all in. No, uh, definitely not. And, um, uh, in fact, most of the clients I work with, um, they're, they're doing an either or thing. They're either going with like a director of operations because that's the level of support they need, or they're going with an integrator because that's the level of support they need. Okay. With, with your director of operations, you are still going to be highly involved in decision making because that director of operations is not going to have the ability to make strategic decisions for the business, they're going to rely on you to either help them make those decisions or to, you know, validate the decision they're recommending is okay. With your integrator, you're going to be more likely to say, I don't need to be involved in those decisions because your integrator is probably going to know more about your business than you do. Like you're going to know what you know, which is like, you know, good design. Your integrator is going to be like, I know finance, I know marketing, I know sales, and I know um, customer service and operate, you know, I, I know those things. And you're going to say, and that's what you're looking for is somebody who knows the stuff you don't know. So you can say, I trust you to make those decisions on my behalf so I can focus on what I do really well, which is, you know, design, or maybe there's some other thing or reason that you started um, your design business. uh, And that's kind of like your passion. Right, 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 right. Okay. So, so knowing and understanding these roles, that's awesome. But then I got to believe that there's probably typical stick points that yeah. you have noticed, right? Like somebody says, this is all that I want. And then you're like, they get start working and then they won't give up control or they don't yep. know how to articulate their vision. Like what are the things that we have to be on the lookout for Casey? Um, the one that you just said is one of the, it can de- derail you really quick. So you're paying money for a person to support you, but if you are not trusting them or not willing to give up control, uh, it, you're wasting your money because that person can't do what they need to do to support you. Um, The other sticking point is probably actually in the hiring process. And this is the one that makes me sad because we as business owners are making these hires because we don't know. We need support. We don't know what we're doing. We're looking for someone else can fill in those gaps for us. And we have to trust that the people we're hiring are are who they say they are and they're doing what they say they're going to be doing. But you really need to be looking for someone who um, can come in and you're you're not going to be onboarding them, right? Because if you knew what to do, you wouldn't need them. So you, <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> you need somebody that's going to come in and say, 
I, I'm bringing to you systems. I'm bringing to you strategies. I'm bringing to you structure. I, I know how like it should be done. And if you give me the reins, I'm going to help improve things for you rather than bringing in someone who's always asking you, how do you want to do this? How should we manage this? How do we want to implement this? Um, so that is incredibly important too, is making sure that the person you're bringing on understands like, no, you're going to own this. And you, you know, I'm, I'm giving you the reins to this. So I just heard a really good uh, sentence, clarifier sentence for us. If anyone is thinking about, I know I need that let next level help. I've gotten to whether it's two or three or four or five or six employees in house, or sometimes it's like you have only one or two employees in house, but you're like me, you have X amount of people out of house, right? But yeah. they're literally functioning every day in my business. It's yes. not like my subs are out there and I see them or they do something for me once a month. It's like once a minute, right? right? Yes. So, but what I just heard there is a really good question to ask ourselves. Do we want somebody that come and says, what do you want done? How do you want it done? Or do we want somebody that says, this is how it's going to happen, sweetie, right? Like, yes. it's like, that is a very good qualifying question for us to do that exploration, because that will be different at different stages of our business and different stages of our journey as an entrepreneur in, in general, right? right? Yeah, that's very clear. That's very clear to me. Okay, so now let's say, I can understand how we develop trust and we develop a process if we're doing the OBM or the DOO where we're expecting and we're encouraging that process of how do I want you to do things? Well, sit down. Let me explain it to you. But how do you, and I get it, you know, like you sound like my cousin Eileen Hahn, by the way, who has said to me for like the last year, she need an integrator, right? Um, but what I what I wonder is, you just said an integrator, a COO is going to come through the door and they're going to be like, this, these are your systems processes and this is what's going to happen. Okay. But how I'm, I'm a, I'm a very good example of once I know you can do something, I ask anybody on my team. They're like, we're, we're having, we're recording this on the day that we are having the premiere of our docu-series where we have over a thousand people registered. And literally two days ago, Diana, my marketing coordinator, she's like, I'm going to need to do a dress rehearsal run for you with you on the tech. And I just looked at her. I'm like, you know that I'm not doing that. <laughs> like figure it out. And I will sit down at 628 when it goes live. Like that's like, stop. I'm not going to sit still for this. And so I am a huge delegator, but I, I trust her. She's been with me two and a half years. Like I know she has it. And I also know if she gets to the point where she's like, no, no, sweetie, I actually do need you to do something. She will rein me in. So what is the process like if one of these designers listening does have a, probably I'm thinking you're uh, either a bigger business, either in, in, in employees or revenue, but how, what is that like when that stranger comes in and they're like, this is how you do it. My brain is, how do I know you know how to do it for my business? Like, I get that business is business. I'm not, you don't have to go all the way to A on this on me. But, you know, how does an outside integrator hit the ground running? Like, that's really the thing. Well, I don't know how other integrators do it because I haven't necessarily worked with them, but I can right. tell you what's been. How do you do it? <laughs> I, well, I can tell you what's been successful for us is after you've done this for so long, which I've been in in business, you know, management, business operations for twenty years. You sort of learn what works and what doesn't work, and so we've condensed it into kind of a process and a system. So we've we've got our tools that work. We've got our processes that work and we have our framework that works. So we're coming in and before someone even decides whether they want to hire us, we're like, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. This is how we interact with your, your team. This is what their part in it is going to be. This is your job description. So we have all of that ready to go so that when you're bringing on the integrator, you're like, I know what to expect. I know it's going to be expected of me. I know it's going to be expected of my team. I know how long it's going to take and I can see the transformation ahead of time. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. 
So basically what you're saying is, I know what I'm doing. Just trust it. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you that's what I'm hearing. Right. <laughs> Which is fine. You know what? It's no different. Honestly, um, I would think sometimes a consumer, if there weren't, see, see, interior designers have a portfolio, right? An interior designer has a portfolio. So the consumer has that same moment of, this is going to be multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars for you to design my home. And how do I know you're going to do a good job? Right. But there's that portfolio that sits there and says, okay, my house isn't going to look just like Sally Smith's house, but I can see that you can make a beautiful house. So this is like really like an intangible portfolio that we have to just trust that. And of course, I'm sure we can do reference checks and, you know, there's probably yeah. case studies and testimonials, but you get the difference of like, like, there's a tangible thing that somebody can look at when they're nervous about hiring yeah. an interior designer, right? Right. Well, and accountability is, I, I really don't, that's a whole nother episode in itself, but just quickly, accountability is part of that. So if you're, if you're bringing somebody on, understand why, why is this person coming in? What are they, what value are they providing and how will I know it's working? And we call that accountability and we figure out how to track that. Like, how can we measure that? What ways, you know, what exists for us to measure that? And so as integrators, we've kind of, um, now I'm a fractional integrator, which means I'm not coming in and working 40 hours a week for you. I'm coming in and working part time for you doing mm-hmm. the things that you most need. So you can actually afford to hire somebody at this level. Um, but we commit to our clients like this is our this is our commitment to you and our promise to you. And this, these are the things that you're going to measure that we're doing. And if at any time it's not working, then you get to decide, uh, are you the right fit for this? Or are, is this like, is this not working? And that's, that's also what we use to monitor our own performance to say, um, what we're doing is working or not working. And if it's not working, we have to pull some levers to change. So. Okay. You know, We have had several conversations on the podcast about this high level person coming into your firm and every person that has told us that they've done it. There wasn't one person that said, yeah, and it was worst money I ever spent. <laughs> like every <laughs> single one was like, slam dunk, <laughs> you know? Right. And I, I, what it is, is, and maybe... You know, it's so funny because my daughter has a podcast, Casey, um, uh, Casey, that she is, it's called Sass Says and every, and it's about mental health and it's about content creation and things like that. And every once in a while, she's like, okay, so this was more of an intercession than an interview. And that means like she got like therapy through her session Uh more than she interviewed. Right. So I'm sort of like feeling like this is an intercession also. Right. Um, But I do know that the designers that have come on that have expressed that they have gone, whether it was post Gino Wickman and the term integrator was popular or it was pr- prior that me, me, you know, getting that mass recognition. Right. Right. Um, and just like somebody that just came in and like did all the things in my business. Um, I think, first of all, they've all expressed positive outcome afterwards. Secondarily is that I think why it might be hard for us, first of all, you made a first statement that yes, a lot of our audience are visionaries. We yeah. are. The most of the audience is, right? Yes. But I think what it's hard is, is we don't have the ability to come into any business, let alone our own, and be like, here's how everything's going to get done. Right. <laughs> like, you know, like, so for us to imagine that an outsider can come in and do this is just like, wait, what? <laughs> right. And, and it's so funny because I, I, sometimes when I've had real life conversations, people have said to me, you know, I don't think as visionaries, like we don't know what we want to do. I don't think just because I'm a visionary, like I don't know how to do things. Right. And it's, that's not really the distinction, is it, Casey? No. I've learned that that's not the distinction. Why don't you go into that distinction a little bit for us? Uh, a lot of the clients I work with are visionaries, and they also enjoy some of the aspects of running the business. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I tell them is, if you are spending your time in, in the, those aspects of running the business, who's driving the ship? 
Mm-hmm. Nobody, nobody is looking out for the the business to make sure that you're staying on top of all the design trends and the construction trends and understanding what people are wanting to have happen with their homes and what other opportunities are out there to um, bring in revenue to the business and um, looking at your vision and saying, are we doing what you know, what I set out to do, are we making an impact the way I want to make an impact? And nobody's looking at that. And if nobody's looking at that, you're kind of just skating and you have no idea what's going to happen one quarter from one quarter to the next or from one year to the next. And so you've got to have space for you to do that um, in your business. And that's, that's why you bring in someone like me is so that you can, you know, dream, scheme, work on those like, um, big partnerships and things that are going to escalate you, um, into whatever your big hairy goals are. Yeah, no, it's true because, um, you know, it's funny. It, it, each of us has our, our, our skill sets and our zones of genius, right. And everything. And it is hard to recognize sometimes that somebody's skill set is completely opposite, but you know, we do know we've talked about it a hundred thousand times in seven years that you have to hire people that aren't duplicates of you. (laughs) I say, right. Like we don't need two people doing the same thing. You don't need, if you, if your capacity for your firm requires one senior designer, then you don't have three. You have a senior designer, a bookkeeper and an office admin. Like you, you split it all up. And so it is, but I think what it is too, is it's not just being a visionary. It's also being an entrepreneur. There's that I can get it done. I can do this. Like, I just have to buckle down. Like, that's what I always say to myself. I just have to buckle down. And my cousin Eileen is like, stop, stop buckling down. (laughs) Just keep up in your like clouds where you are good. (laughs) Yes. So, okay. All right. So are there, when, when somebody goes to think about hiring either a full time or a fractional integrator, Casey, whether it's through your discovery process or just giving somebody, you know, the tips and tricks on if they were going to do it outside of your company, are there, like, when you go to interview somebody as a prospective person who might, you might then do a contract as a fractional integrator, are there things that you look for? Like, what do we have to say to ourselves and be straight in the mirror with? Like, who is it right for, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. I feel like you just read my mind because <laughs> I was like, hey, Luann, I forgot to mention this thing. Um, <laughs> I will tell you, so when we're talking about visionaries, right, and finding somebody who's the opposite of us or who operates differently from us, um, I will tell you that I have on occasion either um, c- consulted with or we attempted to work together with someone who thinks like me. So someone who has an integrator type mindset and it does not work. Mm. You cannot have two integrators, at least with me, you can't because then you have two people who each have the same idea, you know, like, like we have different ideas about how to do the same thing. Mm. So if you are, if you do happen to be somebody who thinks analytically, logically, very project oriented, you don't, you don't need an integrator. You need somebody who has more free thinking skills. And I don't know how that looks yet because I've never seen that work, but um, (laughs) I I know I cannot work with you because um, we're always going to be second guessed. We're not going to do the things the way you think they need to be done. And you're going to still end up keeping your hands in everything because that's what you're, you know, that's what you're primed to do. So Mm. That makes sense because you know what? There are people who are entrepreneurs and your designers and all the things Mm -hmm. who have the visionary skill. Like I would, I have to tell you of all the conversations, like I've had a lot of conversations about this. I've been doing a lot of research. Okay. Um, I think my husband Vinny is a real combination of Mm. a visionary and an integrator. Like he doesn't have quite the abandon in visionary thinking that I have, but he has a heck of a lot of integrator skill sets and personality. It's crazy. And so, and it's not as though he has no visionary aspect, like it's weird. And so the more I've learned about it and you're 100% right, because 
over our lifetime together in business, depending on wh- who, p- which people have worked for us, just him and I, you know, that's one of the places that we're going to butt heads. Like he has no problem if I come up with a crazy idea back in the, you know, or late, um, early nineties, like, Oh, I think we should have a website. He's like, what's a website. Why do we need that? And I'm like, it's the next best thing. And he's like, who needs it? I'm like, we need it. Right. And so he'll be like, all right, fine. Get a website. When I said, let's have a podcast. What's a podcast. We need one. Don't worry. Right. And so the thing is he'll go along with my super out of the box visionary things. But anytime I have some sort of advice suggestion that I've learned from some crazy, wonderful expert on this podcast on the way to do and execute it, execute something is like, nah, we're not going to do it that way. And I'm like, Hmm, that's so fun. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, Nope. You know what I mean? And so, and so, but he also is very visionary in looking at the trends and like, okay, what's happening one quarter, two quarters, three quarters from now, how are we moving people around and stuff like that? So yes. he's a very, yeah, he would not be good to have an integrator because he would tell the integrator mm-hmm. every day, no, no, thank you. None of that. Thank you. <laughs> yes. That's exactly how that works. Uh, yeah. So it's good that you guys have that partnership and you, it's like, you're looking out for each other, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's worked for us. It, it totally has. So, but we do, I do know that there's designers that have that analytical side Mm -hmm. as well. And so it seems to me that that person would probably benefit more from the DOO or even just the business manager. It's like, I'm still going to make all the decisions and maybe that's the way I like my life, but I need you down in the weeds, like the two or three management level below me, making sure all the people are doing the things, right? Yes. That's absolutely how that should work. Makes sense. Makes total sense to me. So, so I guess the thing is, there's a lot of us that are going to sit on this fence and there's some of us that will jump over and make phone calls to you and other people to possibly investigate any of these positions. But what about just like today, like accountability, like here I am, I'm this designer, I'm running my business. And I, I, we've got a lot of, a lot of companies that have the process and systems in place. It's not like it's devoid of process and systems, but there is that tough roundup of accountability. And mm-hmm. I recognize that it probably is a whole podcast, but are there tips that you can give us right away to walk away with and say, here's some strategies for uh, developing accountability into your team, whether it's a team of three or a team of 20? Yeah, this is my favorite topic. So I will uh, <laughs> see if I can condense it enough. I think um, it's it's something that I discovered after doing accountability planning um, and organizational planning for a long time. And I finally started to recognize like trends and like why this is working versus what is not working. And here's what I will say. When you're looking at your business and you're either de- trying to decide do I actually have the right people doing the right things? Or if you're trying to decide who you need to hire next, what I want you to do is um, your, your design business is, has three major functions that keep your, keep the train on the rails. So to speak, you have marketing and sales that brings the business in. You have operations, which delivers what you promise to your clients. And then you have finance, which is making sure you get paid and you pay your bills and you're making smart spending decisions. So everything that happens in your business falls into one of those three categories. Mm -hmm. Instead of looking at your people or looking at what kind of person you need or what role you need to add, sit down and list out all of the functions and the processes that are happening in your business under each of those three categories that are keeping you afloat or that are going to help you grow. We're you so that's where you need to understand what are the functions that happen in my mm. business what are the processes that happen in my business so list them out and there will be um trends where like some processes are going to group together really well and what you're looking for is somebody to be accountable for functions and somebody to be accountable for processes and sometimes a person is going to be accountable for multiple functions and multiple processes. And you can't 
express that in a role because there's not one role that covers marketing operations and finance. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So this is accountability. And what you're saying is I'm looking for someone. I don't care if I call them an assistant or if I call them a designer or if I call them um, a, I don't, I don't know. I can't think of anything off the top of my head right now, but it doesn't matter what you call them. It matters the purpose they serve in the business. And then when you bring that person in right away because you know what they're what roles and functions they're responsible for they're going to own that and they're not going to they're not going to wait to be told what to do they're not going to wait to be um, told how to do something they're going to own it so that's how we do accountability okay I love it all right. I love it. But I have a clarifying question. Yeah. You said you are going to, first of all, the three areas, three main areas of any business, right? All our yep. businesses. And we're going to list all of the things that occur under that business, that, yep. that title, right? So yep. in finance, it's going to be sending clients invoices. It's yep. going to be checking vendors invoices. It's going to be, you know, processing, you know, deposits and balance dues. And it's going to be all those things. Okay. Yep. It's going to be rectifying the check the, um, the credit cards, right? Like you might have multiple people out there with a company credit card. Are they, you know, is somebody checking that they're having lunch with their mother or lunch with a client, right? Like yep. all the things under finance, right? Yeah. And then what you're saying is, then you said, this is the part I'm not sure. Then you want to figure out who is the person that's going to be accountable for the function and the person that's going to be accountable for the process. Yeah. So talk to me about the difference between the function and the process in this yeah. relation, in this group, this conversation. That's a good clarifying question because I I have a a template, you know, like a visual template I use that I I'm seeing it in my head right now, and you are not seeing that. So, <laughs> um, so let's say a a function is a is like an overarching responsibility. So finance as a function, for example, whoever is in charge of finance, um, why do you have finance? Well, you have finance to make sure you get paid. You have finance to make sure your bills are paid and you pay your taxes. So that's kind of like the accountability of finance. But mm. then what you said is you're just listing underneath of that what else happens underneath there. Well, we have Got invoicing it. clients. We have um, following up on um, overdue payments. We have all of that stuff. And um, that would be a process. So depending on how big the business is, you know, if you bigger businesses have so much work to do that they have to divide those things up yes. among multiple people. Um, but some businesses don't. And you might have one person that does finances and operations all at the same mm. time. So it just depends on how much work you have and how much capacity is needed, how much you kind of need to break that down. Okay. That makes that now it's clear to me. Like for example, in window works, Catherine is responsible for getting all of the invoices from all of the people, all of the vendors and making sure that they're accurate. But then, you know, Joanna is going to make sure that they're all actually entered into individual projects, like every cost that goes into every individual project. But then ultimately, JC is going to pay the bill for it. So he's the one who is the person that is a count. Well, it was Vinny for a thousand years and now it's JC, right? So everybody's like, wait a minute, what happened to Vin Man? Vin Man <laughs> is turning it over to JC, right? So what it is, is Vin and slash JC are responsible for the, the function of finance, but different people have different own accountability to the processes under finance. Yes, absolutely. And then if I'm an interior designer where maybe I'm up to three or four employees, I might do everything related to finance yep. as opposed to, well, I probably have a bookkeeper that does a lot of the day to day, but really most of the accountability under process and function are going to come to me. Yes. Got it. Got it. And then the bigger firms, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, the bigger firms, Tracy Connell and, um, you know, um, uh, you know, I'm just thinking of the bigger Susan Winterstein, some of these bigger firms where they've got 10, 15, 20 employees. Yep. 
Right. So they probably also actually have somebody who's accountable for function and process and they're above all of that. Yes. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So that makes sense. And you know what I love about that is even if you are, I would say if you're a company with five, eight, 10, 15, 20 employees and you're having problems with things getting done and people completing things, then there probably is a problem in the communication of who owns the process and who owns the function. I can see that now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's the number one thing. Absolutely. (laughs) I can see it because what happens is I'm, you know, I'm visualizing window works as window works has grown through the years. It's in, I always say to everybody, you know, if you're a relatively smart human and you have dedication and you have um, at least some sort of support around you, whether that was like me, Vinny and Billy being a trio of owners or just having good quality employees, what I noticed is we could get to 3 million in gross revenue pretty good, pretty easy. You know, there was growing pains and bumps along the way, but it's the three to 5 million revenue that is like, oh, this is a whole different animal. Yep. And the reason is, is because now exactly what you just said, there's quote unquote middle management that are not necessarily enunciated, not necessarily with their functions with their accountability tied to their functions because it's just like, well, doesn't Vin do that way? It doesn't Lou do that. Well, I thought JC was doing that. And I can see that this setting down, if you are a firm out there that is in that growth period, probably from two to 5 million, if you're feeling like the ground is shaking under you, this is a really good exercise. So just like, okay, that used to be all of that. That's me. But now guess what? Some of it's you, but we haven't actually said that, right? Yes. I love it. I love it. And then also, even if you're a smaller company, maybe you've just got two employees, right? Like, I thought you did that. I thought you did that. Well, why did anybody think anybody did it? Where is the rules where it says who's doing it? Right. right. <laughs> well, and I, um, you know, this started out. So if you're following the Gino Wickman, they're they're telling you this is a tool for the businesses one to 10 million or two to 10 million or whatever. But I think that this, if you can start out, even if you're hiring your first employee and you're doing it this way, you're setting yourself up for so much easier, better success and transition for every team member you hire. Oh, a hundred percent. Every single person that I've spoken to that has worked the traction system through their business and has, you know, made use of an integrator and all of these accountability procedures, um, Literally, if you start it when it's just you and you and yeah. one other person, like, because now it's like, it's like the difference between learning how to swim when you're four years old and 40 years old. Yes. Right. Like when you learn how to swim when you're four and you dunk a couple of times, whatever, your mother catches you or you're over yes. it. But when you're 40 and you are out in the middle of the pool and you're not sure, you know, you're smart enough to know I could die. Yeah. <laughs> like it's more painful, right? Oh, yeah. Whereas you know, when you're, you do it, when you're a new entrepreneur, it's just, this is how we do things. Here. Yes. Well, yeah. and I fixed, I am, am fixing and have fixed those messes where you've got 35 employees yeah. and mm. it's so much harder to, you, to undo everything and redo it again, because you're going to lose people that are like, I, this isn't what I was hired to do mm. or who are tired of showing up and not having any idea what's going on. And it takes forever. So yes. yeah. yeah, it does. So, so talk to us about the ideal. We talked about who is not an ideal candidate for a fractional um, integrator or even a full-time integrator who you're having an interview with somebody and what kinds of things do you want to hear out of somebody? And you're like, yep, you're a candidate. Um, well, this is personal to me. Yes. Yes. But I do think like in some respects it's helpful for any business, but if, um, if I'm talking to somebody whose main focus is just on revenue, I don't want to work with them because, uh, well, what I want to hear them say is that they have a purpose or they have a passion or a focus on something. Revenue is a result of that idea that takes off. But if um, you're just 100%, if you're just in it for the money, what's going to happen is your decisions are just going to be driven by 
random whatever's working at the moment. They're not, maybe not going to sometimes maybe not be the best ethical decisions or the best mm -hmm. business decisions or the best decisions for your clients or your community. And so I really think that you have to know and understand there has to be a purpose behind what you're doing so that we're not just chasing money all over the place because that there's no fulfillment in that. And it's also um, changes daily. Okay. I love it. I love it. And is there, are there revenue levels that make more sense or it doesn't matter? You would take somebody at the beginning stages or you take somebody at 10 years, 20 years in that finally is like, that's it, line in the sand. I want to get this place organized. Um, I'm going to give some parameters and just know there's nuance to everything, but more important than revenue levels is the number of people you have. So the more people that you have doing things for your business, the more value you're going to get from an integrator. But just knowing how much it costs, like this is a non-revenue generating role that you're bringing into the business. So this role has to be able to somehow either reduce your costs, increase your profits, or um, a combination of both. And so usually the businesses who are able to bring us in and afford doing that are at least over a million. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. I love it. Anything that I will use my daughter's line from her podcast, anything that you wish I asked you that I hadn't asked you? <laughs> um, you know, Nothing that I wish you had asked me, but I just want to mention that if the, the, I go into incredible like new detail into these concepts on Female Founders Breaking Boundaries podcast. Mm. So if you're interested in learning more about how you can create your own um, accountability, delegation, d make decisions on who you need to hire, um, there's episodes out there that are going to go into um, very specific detail. You should be able to walk away from them with an outline that you can implement in your business. I love it. I know. I have been kind of binging on the podcast lately. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yes. Uh, so um, I'm so grateful for you to share your time with us, Casey, today, because um, I do know, like I said, we have had multiple designers come on here and tell us, uh, Laura Umansky, Vic, Vicky Sereni, uh, Reagan Baker, multiple that have come on and said, yes, this was a game changer for my business when I not only either hired an integrator or a COO, but, but more just got clarity in the roles and intentionally filled this like, you know, like it's almost like a little management hierarchy, right? So yeah. that we can keep with our head above water and doing, you know, the lane that we're supposed to be in. And if that's design and rainmaking for a, a design principle, like I feel like that's their two lanes, right? Yeah. Overseeing the design, the vision of not just the company, but the aesthetic for the clients, but also, you know, rainmaking. They're the face, they're the people, like, he, like they bring the clients in. And if you're sitting there trying to figure out if your, you know, installers, you know, set, put their credit card receipts in. It's just like, yeah, <laughs> I, I like to say if you hire somebody and you switch from doing all the things to managing and you're not saving any time, you've probably made the wrong hire. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. Well, um, Casey, tell us how we find you. And of course, we'll also put it in the show notes, but tell us how we find you. Uh, my website is c-sweetboutique.com. So that's C-Sweet Boutique. And um, you can find out how we work. You can read about more about how fractional integrators work with you. You can also connect with us there. And um, of course, again, another plug for the podcast, uh, come you know, listen to me, see if you like what I have to say over at Female Founders Breaking Boundaries. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much, Casey. Okay. Lots of ideas, lots of ideas from this conversation, right? I am relating on all levels from Window Works to Exciting Windows to Luann Nigara Inc. And it does remind me, as I mentioned in the show, of the few conversations that I've had over the years with Laura Umansky and Vicki Sereni, who literally talked about in the episode how it was a game changer to work with an integrator in their businesses. Reagan Baker, Reagan Baker talked about how, how important it is to have a team that shares your values. Okay, all of this comes with strong strong leadership. That's the point. Okay. Now it's a little scary 
to think about hiring people at this level um, and giving over so much responsibility. I know it, right? And and I, first of all, I love that Casey refers to you as a visionary, right? Because she knows. She knows that's what you are. We are. We have big plans. We have visions. We are the entrepreneur. But But the thing is, she knows and we know. We don't always have the capacity and the wherewithal to say, this is how it's going to happen. We have the vision for where we want to be. But that little technical part about getting there, sometimes it's tricky, right? Right? And it's not that we're incompetent. It's not that we don't know how to do things. It's not that we couldn't even figure it out if God, for, for, for crying out loud, we had to, right? But sometimes, isn't it just recognizing it's not your superpower? And why do you keep banging your head against the wall? Sometimes we just have to bring in somebody who is the yin to our yang, right? And here's the thing Casey said, when you do go to hire an integrator or a D director of operations or a COO, I love that she was clear. No, you are looking for someone who's going to come in the door and say to us, this is what I will do. This is what I will bring to your business. This are the systems, the strategy, and the structure, okay? They will tell you. That's what I heard loud and clear. And that is the music part to me anyway. And if you're like me, visionary, you know, that personality like I am, then you know that is part of that little fear. It's like, I know something over here has to happen, but I'm not really sure what that path is to getting it done. Because by the way, if we were sure, we wouldn't know we needed somebody. We would just be doing it. And so that little thing right there, that a stranger is going to come in and say, after looking at your business, after interviewing you, after talking to the different people on your team, they are going to have the plan love that. And if anybody tells you, this is what I heard, maybe Casey's got to call me and tell me differently. But what I heard was, if you're hiring a COO or an integrator, and they're not telling you what the plan is, then you're not really hiring a COO or an integrator. You might be hiring a DOO or an executive assistant, somebody who, you know, one day with more education, know-how, whatever, um, could possibly groom into the COO or integrator. But what she said and what I heard is, when you hire at that level, they know. And that just feels so good, doesn't it? <laughs> now, you don't have to go and hire everybody all in order, right? You can skip a step. You can go right to the integrator. The decision is based on the growth of your business and the level of support you need and probably also the dreams for your business, the, what you have as your vision, okay? It's not a decision you make lightly, right? In all aspects, it's a practice of listening to your inside voice. Listen to what your inside voice says, right? You know what you're capable of. You know what you're willing to do. And it's the taking of the time, the taking of the time to figure it out. What do you need help with? How could you be supported in your own dang business, right? So remember, we talked on the show with Fernando Duque, the founder of Duke Renders. You have to go back and listen to that episode as well. He said there was a point that they knew that he knew they needed to stop doing everything, just to stop DIYing his own business, right? This is a big indication that it's time to bite the bullet and hire someone to help I, when you are DIYing it all, okay? Fernando has an integrator in his business. His name is Gustavo, and I cannot sing his praises enough. In every single meeting, every single conversation, G Gustavo's integrator brain just slices through the starry ideas of mine and Fernando's. <laughs> he literally is very quiet. And then all of a sudden he'll say something and we just kind of look at each other like, oh yeah. <laughs> but what I love more is after all of us crazy visionaries in the room come up with the ideas, like the next me meeting, Goose has got this entire plan. Like these are the accountability charts. These are who do this. These are the steps under that. Like you cannot fathom. If you've never ever watched this, felt this, had this in real life, you almost can't fathom it because your brain doesn't work that way. Right. If you know, now there are entrepreneurs that have integrated brains. I talked to you guys about my, my husband, Vincenzo. I really believe he's a hybrid. I really, really believe he's a hybrid. Um, but most of us are not, most of us are one lane or the other. And so, um, I, I, I just encourage you, if you're in that spot, if you're in that tip and you're just tipping over and you're just like that one step could make that difference, don't hesitate. Good people on your team is the, is the way for your vision 
to come to life. All right. So thank you, Casey. I'm grateful that you came on the show to share your knowledge and your expertise and to clarify these important roles for us, right? So we can visualize our team growing up through these roles, right? Or if we need to leapfrog around them, right? If you're interested, I suggest you reach out to Casey. We will put her, um, you know, links and so forth in the show notes. Love it. All the things. All righty. I hope uh, you guys have a great day. Decide to be excellent. Thank you for joining me today. This podcast is a production of Luann Nigara Inc. If you want to know more about me, my books, or Luann University, go to luannnigara.com. And if you are interested in having Window Works help you with your next window treatment or awning project in the New York, New Jersey metro area, go to windowworksnj.com to learn more. Have an excellent day.